say hello and um, mention that we will, uh, even though people are still joining us, we will endeavor to start on time because we have two wonderful speakers today. Uh, you should be able to see the um, agenda for today, um, but just a, a bit of housekeeping in the first few minutes. Uh, so first of all, welcome, and it's great to see such a, a great variety of um, people from different areas uh, in the UK, um, as well as organizations and Public Health England. Um, just to introduce ourselves, uh, myself and Sophia here. Uh, Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this SFC webinar. So yeah, we're um, so we uh, work on the Sugar Smart campaign, and uh, this webinar is um, being hosted by Sustainable Food Cities, uh, which we'll cover in a moment. Uh, but just a bit of housekeeping. Um, hopefully, you can hear us. Um, if you're having any issues, um, you can use the um, there's you have two chat options. There's the attendee chat where uh, you can post uh, questions as we go along, uh, but you can also um, send a message privately to the presenters. So if you have any issues with your sound, please use that chat section. Um, also, there's, um, there's a button on the top middle of your screen, it's, uh, it's three dots, so you can click on that to toggle your um, sound, um, your sound settings. So please do give that a try if you have any issues. Um, again, we'll uh, we'll make a note if anybody's having issues hearing on what to do. Uh, so yeah, so just without further ado, um, uh, we we will get going. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, just to mention, um, so we are from Sustain the campaign, um, the <laughs> the campaign for better food and farming, uh, the Alliance for Better Food and Farming, sorry about that. And uh, one of our campaigns is Sugar Smart, which we'll be covering in a moment. But before we get to that, uh, we want to mention a few words about sustainable food cities. So the Sugar Smart campaign is a feature campaign of sustainable food cities um, uh, currently. And uh, we just want to sh get, use this opportunity to uh, speak a little bit more about sustainable food cities because not all of you will be familiar, but there are certainly opportunities for many of you guys to think about um, engaging with this fantastic project um, and looking to join the network. So sustainable food cities is a movement of 51 towns, cities, boroughs, and counties that share the same approach to trans for transforming food and food culture. The sustainable food cities approach is about establishing an effective cross-sector food partnership of key stakeholders. This can include public agencies, businesses, NGOs, academics. Uh, it's about incorporating healthy and sustainable food into local policy, strategy, and planning. And it's about developing and delivering a food strategy and action plan to tackle key food challenges in the local area. So this is really about uh, building a long-term approach uh, to improving your local food systems. And of course, some of you guys will be part of the Sustainable Food Cities Network, but might be a bit new to Sugar Smart. And of course, some of you um, have been working on Sugar Smart, but you might want to consider looking at the breadth of work happening in your local area. So this is just a, an opportunity to encourage you to take a look. Um, the Sustainable Food Cities approach is a tried and tested model for driving positive change. And um, if your city or local area would like to know more about the benefits of becoming a member, please do get in touch um, with uh, Leon Ballin, who is the program manager. Um, and just to uh, mention a bit more, uh, so you don't have to be a sort of um, a city, an all dancing, all sitting, all singing city or area to join. So there are different levels of joining. You can join the um, SFC email group uh, where you can uh, share and hear from others about sharing best practice and advice. Um, there's a newsletter that you can join as well that um, has some really great news uh, opportunities for funding. So it's another really great place to find out what else is happening across the country. Um, you can also, as part of joining SFC, get support for developing your cross-sector food partnerships. So there's quite a bit in terms of support, resources, um, getting started and other um, other guides to develop a, a cross-sector and cross-issue approach to improving your food system. Um, the SFC membership network members can also attend our series of regional and national events and, of course, join webinars such as today's webinar and other learning and exchange forums. Uh, the network members can also benefit from our uh, online resources and support. 
uh, from the Sustainable Food Cities team. And also SFC has an award scheme which is designed to recognize and celebrate the success of those places taking a joined up holistic approach to food issues that are achieving significant positive change on a range of key food issues. So it's a really fantastic way uh, to have broader recognition of the great work you're doing. So uh, do check out on the website, there's a getting the basics right um, guide. Um, this is a, a good first step. And please do get in touch with Leon uh, for further info. Thanks so much. So. Um, so on to Sugar Smart. So uh, Sugar Smart is um, is an approach to engage um, uh, to engage uh, local partners at a cross at a cross sectoral level to improve uh, local food provision and engage people on reducing their sugar consumption. Uh, so we have plenty of information on our website, but in the interest of time, I want to get into sort of the nitty gritty of it and uh, share with you where we're at right now. Um, as a campaign. So first of all, we now have 22 campaigns that have launched, uh, most recently Tower Hamlets, but there are 23 more that are in development stages. So uh, our campaign network is growing really <laughs> week by week. Uh, and so we also have over 700 sector participants taking action. So these are organizations, businesses, and various settings that are committing to actions to help reduce sugar overconsumption. This is also just a helpful reminder, if you're working with participants in your local area, um, make sure that they're registering on the website because we wanna make sure that everybody's counted. So we know that the number is higher, much higher than uh, 717, which is like the last check of the website. Um, also just to mention uh, over the past few months, um, 16, SFC grants have been awarded to local food partnerships running Sugar Smart campaigns. So again, that's another benefit of joining SFC is being able to access um, these uh, grants for campaigns and coordination. So also, uh, and this is I think useful for those of you that are fairly new to Sugar Smart, um, is just to mention our website, definitely worth checking out. Um, but our website is more than just a place to learn more. It's actually our central campaign platform. Um, this, is a, this is a place where both uh, those who are uh, leading on local campaigns who are co coordinating local Sugar Smart campaigns can register, but it's also a place for local participating organizations, businesses, and other settings to register as well. Uh, it's a fantastic bank of uh, resources, so nobody has to start from scratch. There are plenty of resources on uh, which actions uh, different settings can take, uh, places to start, uh, guidance, case studies, and of course, resources for public engagement. It's also the place to log local action and impact. So this is actually, uh, the website is a really great way to have a broader picture of the changes that are happening at your local level. Um, and it's a really great way to look at really how, which areas are, um, are engaging, what kind of actions they're taking, and really making sure that those actions are being counted as part of a national picture of change, uh, really, which is exactly what we're seeing. I mean, up and down the country, um, so many hundreds of settings and organizations are doing changes for the long term. Um, so definitely do make a use of this resource. If you're considering starting a Sugar Smart campaign, you can pre-register and that gives you access to our handbook and a uh, standard presentation. So it's a good place to start, but of course do get in touch with us. We would absolutely love to hear from you if you're considering running a local Sugar Smart campaign or if you're part of an organization that wants to take action. So the other thing to mention is that it's where our support is more than just the website. We're also here uh, to support over the phone and email. Um, we also offer support uh, for developing your action plan, for planning launching your campaign. Uh, we can also support in person for campaign launches. So for example, uh, providing a presentation or talk or really doing that kind of uh, motivation to get everybody uh, pledging, taking action. And, um, and then we also offer uh, support in the form of, of course, uh, webinars and um, supporting uh, local areas to link up with one another and share best practice in other ways. So there's definitely plenty of support here on hand, so do make the most of it. 
Um, and so, of course, just to let you know, this is what you see when you come to the Sugar Smart website and click on Get Involved. So Run Campaign is um, if you are at a local authority or a food partnership, um, cross-sector food organization level, and you're looking to run a cross-sector campaign. So this is where you're looking to utilize um, the links you have uh, across different sectors. Uh, to get them on board, then you can click run on campaign. Uh, but if you're an organization such as a business or a school, uh, community organization, uh, sports and leisure center, uh, if you're going sugar smart, click go sugar smart. This is where you can choose from a menu of actions to take forward. And of course, if you just want to stay in touch, get our newsletter and find out more, click on follow us uh, and stay in the loop. And then uh, before we move on to the fantastic examples from a couple of our local campaigns. I just want to mention these are the 10 settings that we're engaging. Um, so this is this includes uh, schools and other education settings, uh, hospitals, employers, um, restaurants, retail, tourism and venues, of course, community groups and other organization, and sports and leisure, which is a really key sector that we're trying to engage. And so we're supporting uh, local areas um, to really make sure that they get their sports and leisure settings on board. Um, so, but you will mention, you will might notice from the theme of today's webinar uh, that there's one sector that isn't listed here, and that's actually uh, water companies. Because um, even though th this isn't one of the ten sectors that we've identified. Um, in the development stages of the campaign. It's coming out to be that at a local level, water companies can be a fantastic supporting partner. And so this is one of the things that we'll be hearing about from our, uh, our speakers on um, how they've worked with their local water companies uh, to uh, create resource and, uh, and actually amplification to reach young people and to engage them on uh, reducing their sugar overconsumption. Um, so without further ado, um, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Um, so our, uh, our first speakers are uh, from the Sugar Smart Bristol campaign, who have, uh, so this is Wendy and Claire, who have been doing some fantastic work uh, with Bristol Water, um, as well as uh, other local partners um, to reach young people. Uh, and this includes their fantastic Thirsty Eyes campaign. So uh, without further ado, I will pass the mic on, as it were, to uh, Claire and Wendy. Hello, everyone. Um, it's Claire Lohman here. I'm going to speak first and then pass on to my colleague, Wendy. Um, thank you for inviting us to speak today. Uh, we started the Sugar Smart Bristol program. We started planning it um, mid-2016, so we're coming up to um, two years soon. Um, and actually one of the first um, opportunities we got for um, developing and launching the work was um, to engage with young people through our youth council and, uh, and wider, actually a wider group of young people. So I'm going to talk about um, how we planned and prepared and um, delivered the youth debate. Um, we did benefit from the experience of um, Brighton, who already had a Sugar Smart programme, and we talked to them about what they'd done, and they had also uh, carried out a youth debate. And then shortly afterwards, Exeter um, in our region also um, we linked up with. So it's really important to kind of share experience, I think. Um, so in terms of our um, engaging young people through the youth debate uh, part of the programme, um, what I did first of all was took a, what we call a warm up briefing to the Youth Council. Um, and what we were aiming to do there was to raise the issue of sugar um, in the diet, um, but actually ask them how we might engage with young people on this issue. Um, so they had um, had a debate previously and used our council chamber um, on a different health topic. So it was something that they felt they wanted to repeat. I think they'd done that about two years before. Um, so they felt that they wanted to have another debate um, and um, help plan what the questions would be, how it would run, uh, how it could be filmed, etc. And also, increasingly how we could use um, both local media, but also social media, because that had significantly increased in the two years since they'd done their previous debate. Um, we also, in the planning phase, talked to them about um, 
not only involving youth council members, but also other young people that represented groups and organisations. So some of the um, equalities groups who may not have sat to become a youth councillor, but actually were a really important um, sector to hear from. Um, and in terms of um, uh, sort of preparation for the actual um, event, um, the two youth mayors that were um, in office agreed that they would chair the debate. Um, they wanted it to be um, quite formal, so they wanted to use the council chamber, whereas I know, I think when I saw the film with the Brighton one, they'd used a kind of really cool, funky cafe, which if I'd have been planning it without speaking to our uh, youth council, they, um, you know, I would have might have assumed that that was the sort of venue they wanted, but actually they wanted something um, quite formal where they could sit on kind of opposite sides of the room and, and present different arguments. Um, we kept it to um, a, a developed an outline for 45 minutes. We actually had the council chamber for, for a whole hour, but we, um, it, so fairly short debate in that sense. Um, we had about 30 people attend, plus um, some other um, parents and carers. Um, so what you'd have to consider is if you wanted more, you know, so if you wanted 75, 100 participants, actually you'd probably need more time to ensure that everyone that wanted to speak was able to speak. Um, I developed a briefing for the participants, um, and that's so that they could have a think through in advance um, about the issue and it was just two sides so it was just giving them some of the the background about the links to dental health weight um, diabetes um, we said that they, they could prepare for the session by watching some of the Jamie's sugar rush um, clips if they were uh, I think those had an age certificate of 15 so most of the young people that was relevant to but we said that was an, op an option we asked them to think about um, and then with the two opposing views, um, which I'll go into in a moment. And then I also gave them another of another sort of list of topics, uh, things that they could think about, um, such as things like, do you think sugar's addictive? Do you think it affects your behaviour and mood? Um, who influences what we eat? So they had um, that to read in advance. And um, that was just so that they could think through what they might want to say uh, or not or how they might respond to other people presenting those issues. Um, we also needed to gain informed consent from participants. Um, and we also had to make them aware that um, we were going to make a film of the um, debate and that the local media would be there. But we did put in um, safeguards to ensure that any young people that didn't want to be filmed um, weren't and um, that the local media didn't film live. They just did interviews afterwards. So um, so that people could participate, but actually do it without uh, subsequently becoming part of the film. Uh, we did a run through in the council chamber before the date. So that was just basic preparation, making sure the youth mayors were happy, making sure the technology worked, um, sort of thinking through how it might look. Um, and also with the guy that did the filming as well, so that he could have a look at the angles for filming and stuff like that. OK, and then in terms of um on the night once we got it all set up um there were a number of um other people there um who we invited and we in the um briefing to the young people in advance we told them that any adults that were there um they had a specific role so it wasn't just people coming along to see uh what was happening we didn't have the public chamber open um but the people that were there um were there to support them clarify any points, um, but not to influence the debate. So as you can see, we had um, a number of people from public health. Uh, we also had the youth and community worker that supports the youth council. We had someone that was an um, expert in food marketing and how food marketing companies uh, um, uh, promote their products. And um, some of the young people did invite a parent or a carer with them. So um, this is how the young people decided they wanted to start the um, debate. They wanted to present two opposing views. Uh, they, what they wanted, some of them wanted to acknowledge that we were facing big health challenges and that one of the ways to address this would be come by becoming a sugar, sugar smart city. And then some of the other young people wanted to present the opposing view, the sort of uh, the nanny state argument 
that people should be free to choose and that we shouldn't be doing anything. Um, so we had a really interesting um, discussion um, and uh, the young people were also using um, Twitter uh, while, during, during the debate as well, just to kind of say this is what's, what we're doing. Um, so they then, after um, after some initial kind of presentations, some sort of initial speeches on those two issues to present the opposing views, they did start to come together and say, well, actually, if this is an issue, um, then what would we, um, what would a sugar smart city look like? And, and where is Bristol now and where does it need to, to get to? And um, they they had really um, had a really good range of um, understanding and um, discussion that they presented. So they um, they talked about how we should be educating through schools. So start young, influence young people's behaviour. Um, they talked about some of the wider um, sort of national issues around food labelling and sugar tax and the media. So some of those big systems that were influencing the young people's health and actually how. How do we um, change those? Um, they had a really good understanding about um, uh, low income families and their food choices. So the young person themselves um, might come from a more affluent background, but they had really good empathy with the whole range of people that live in Bristol. Um, and they had quite a good understanding of how we should be preventing rather than waiting for a problem to arrive and then treating it. Um, they did have some sort of general concerns and uh, and that was partly because um, some of them were youth counsellors. They had general concerns about how we would fund and resource the programme um, and making sure that we drew in um, funding and, and support from other organisations in the city. And um, when you get the slides afterwards, at the bottom of this slide, um, there is actually the link to the uh, to the film that we made. Um, so it ended up being about 20 minutes long um, from a 45 minute debate. We edited it. We sent it out to all the young people that have been there. We made sure that they were happy with the content. Um, we wanted to give them the opportunity that if they'd kind of been filmed, said something, but subsequently thought, actually, I don't want that to be kind of out there on YouTube, that we would edit it out. Um, and so they all checked it and signed it off before we sort of pressed the button to um, to share it uh, publicly. And you, from that link, you could um, have a look at that after the session. Okay, so that's me. Um, I haven't seen any questions flash up, but I will keep an eye on them. And I will hand over to uh, my colleague, Wendy, now. Thank you, Claire. Just following on from that, um, after we'd been running Sugar Smart Bristol for a few months, we decided that the one age group that we weren't reaching were the 15 to 18 year olds, very much linking with that debate. We knew that through schools, primary schools were very keen and doing a lot around Sugar Smart and in the early years of secondary school. But we weren't able to, well, we hadn't been able to really engage 15 to 18 year olds. So we wanted to look at how we might be able to manage that. And we're fortunate in getting a grant of £5,000 from the Sustainable Food Cities. Um, and use that to develop an idea about reaching this particular age group. We opened up um, an invitation to tender to marketing companies. We sent invites out to at least four companies that we knew did a lot of work with young people. And three of them took up our invitation to tender. We had a group together, including our PR team, our marketing team, our um our local ambassador for food, Jamie Oliver's Food Revolution and various members of public health and also invited a couple of members of the Youth Council to attend the presentations from the companies. And there was, as a result of that, we recruited Create Marketing to work with us and develop a programme for particularly geared towards 15 to 18 year olds. It's very difficult trying to keep young people on board with some of these things, partly because of their commitments um, in terms of attending school and other commitments they might have outside of school. So we did carry on with the steering group to support this programme, um, but didn't really have young people engaged with that. 
So one of the things that happens often in Bristol is they have what they call a city hall takeover, where young people come in and literally take over the first floor of the city hall um, and have meetings with various councillors and meet to talk to people about various different projects. So one of these um, city hall takeovers we used to connect, create marketing with some of our young people. So they had an opportunity to actually talk to them, understand um, where they found their information from, who they talked to to get their information and how they might best develop um, some kind of programme that they would all connect with. Um, what they did find was that most of them used YouTube. A few did use Facebook and there was a bit of a debate as to uh, sorry, I've just got a question up. Um, there's a bit of a debate as to how many actually used Facebook. And I think it is very variable in this particular age group, but um, still worth using. And Instagram account was the other social media aspect that we decided to use. So I just wanted to share with you a little bit of the video. A bonus point for anyone who can guess the tune and the film from which it comes. Um, if you haven't seen it, the video itself, the main one is about three minutes long, but this is an edited version. Um, it should play. And the guarantee that you will be singing that for the rest of the day. So that was um, Hungry Eyes from Dirty Dancing, um, adapted for our advertising campaign using social media. And we also, as part of that, developed static images that um, could be used on Facebook and Instagram. One of the things we did do, or at least um, Create Health, who developed the program for us, used Google AdWords to drive viewers to the YouTube videos. When using these, you can actually um, control the areas that the information gets sent out to. So they set up a geographical location covering our Bristol postcodes. And through this route, we know that of about 59,800 people actually. Um, clicked on the Google AdWord and went to YouTube and viewed the video. The average view time for the video was two minutes, which actually is very long. It counts as a video viewing if it's longer than 30 seconds. And it's unusual to have an average view time of a full two minutes. So we were really pleased with this. The cost per click, as in um, people clicking through the Google AdWords, was um, two pence per click which I'm informed is very efficient and a good use of money, that one. Um, the click-through rate, another way of looking at how effective the campaign has actually been, was 16.5%. And I'm also told that if it's more than 5%, it is deemed to be very efficient. So I think we were really pleased with those um, results. As you can see, there was a fairly even split of male to female viewers. And we did reach the mostly the 18 to 24 year group and a smaller number through the 13 to 17 year group. But through Google AdWords, it's sometimes quite difficult to tell because people have to be 18 to sign up to um, certain things in Google, Google. So they wouldn't necessarily know um, age range for this. So that just shows a very um, loose postcode breakdown. It just shows that majority of the viewings were from Bristol. So 93% of the views on YouTube were through Bristol, which is what we intended by controlling the geographical location. 
and the fair will spread across Bristol City with the different postcodes there. And then through Facebook and Instagram, that was using the um, static images mostly and being able to click on those to go straight through to the YouTube videos. So again, we had over 14,000 video views. And with those, a video view counts as more than three seconds. So um, that still was good. So lots of people did actually view the video, but the average view time, as I said before, was about two minutes. Slightly different gender split here, so many more female than male looking at that. And it does suggest that possibly Facebook is used um, more by women than perhaps it is by men. Instagram, I don't know so much about. But again, this covers um, a targeting of 13 to 20 year olds. So we've been very happy with the um, campaign for our young people. Um, and I just wanted now to move on to working with uh, Bristol Water. As many of you know, we've been very lucky in Bristol in that we've had a, um, a Jamie Oliver Food Revolution ambassador working with us, Fiarjan, who has been instrumental in us being able to contact various different partners across the city um, and encourage them to work with us. Uh, and we know that you know Jamie Oliver's name actually opens doors for us and we've been really fortunate in that. So this is what happened with Bristol Water that um, Fee initially had the uh, conversation with them to try and get them on board with us. And they were very enthusiastic. Um, take that statement of an offer of £10,000 loosely. They, it wasn't a money offer as such. They did come to us full of ideas lots of different ways of being able to work with us, which included putting water fountains in all schools, doing lots of school lessons and activities, um, purchasing water bottles for all children in primary schools. Um, and we had a few conversations with them initially. It's when they went back and found the cost of actually doing this or the difficulties in doing some of it as well wouldn't fit with what they were able to do as a company. So just talking through what was available, what they could do, they agreed that they would support our um, Sugar Smart campaign through their newsletter, Water Talk, which goes out to 55,000 households across Bristol. And for us, that was ideal. They were very happy to have a front page cover and as a um, double page spread in the newsletter. And also they were very keen to work with us and going to festivals and events. Bristol Water themselves have an award-winning water bar, which has um, been something that they've, they've created themselves and has actually been very popular at some of these festivals and events. So for us, it was a really useful way of working with them. One of the things that they did do as part of this was to look at developing a superhero. Um, and just before Water Talk magazine came out, there was a social media campaign uh, naming our superhero. And we think he's great. We did ask if he could perhaps wear orange pants with Sugar Smart written on them somewhere. But that was perhaps one step too far for the water company. So um, they were more than happy to have a front page. Um, and as I say, a middle spread going out to the 55,000 homes. Their water bar, as well as I said, was a water, an award winning one. And at the time, they were about to repaint the whole water bar. So, again, in conversation with them, they were more than happy to include Sugar Smart logos within the, the redesign of the water bar. And also we've worked with Sea to City, which includes refill as well. So very much about um, affecting plastic waste and making sure that we don't discard too much plastic and limit the amount of plastic that we use. And so carrying this out, we went to various festivals and events with them, with the superhero who is now named Hydro Harry. Um, and work with them there. One thing that we did need to be very careful of and very aware of 
was the resources that we had to give out. Uh, we, we use quite a few sticky badges for children, giving them out when we've had a conversation with them about Sugar Smart. But um, when working with City to Sea and Bristol Water, they were very keen that we didn't use anything that wasn't biodegradable. So we had to have a real think about the um, types of resources that we could use at some of our festivals and events. Um, Bristol is quite well known for its festivals and events. And one thing that we did have was just as a sort of gimmick um, and to encourage people to get involved and have conversations was a giant um, photograph frame and encourage people to tweet pictures or put them on Facebook with various hashtags, including hashtag refill and hashtag sugar smart Bristol. Um, this year, we have actually decided that we won't be doing any of the, the events, festival events with them. It's been very difficult trying to find enough volunteers to support this with us, and it's quite time consuming. Bristol Water is still going to go ahead and we'll still um, work with us on social media um, as we will with them and provide the social media support for them and various press releases. But they will start to do a bit more work in schools and hopefully we can continue to link in with them on that. And that's it from me. And we'll hand you over to Rachel Hunt. Just before we, we go on to our next presenter, uh, there are some uh, clarification questions for, uh, for the Bristol team. So let's answer these quickly uh, before moving on to the next presentation. Um, so I'll uh, let's start with the organisations involved in setting up the campaign in Bristol. If if Claire um, or Wendy could could remind us, um, in terms of what's actually starting the campaign, the Sugar Smart campaign. Yeah, so we linked with quite a few different partners across the city. Bristol Sport being a very key one who we worked with to actually launch our Sugar Smart program. Um, obviously, Bristol Water. Um, my mind has gone blank. Yeah, uh, I mean, probably um, because we've only shown the Sugar Smart Bristol um, logo so far. We probably haven't said that um, it was initially we, we both work in public health for Bristol City Council. So it was initially mm -hmm. us in partnership with um, our Jamie Oliver um, foundation ambassador and then brought on other big organizations in the city such as the universities um hospitals uh bristol sports um so but the initial kind of um program planning was between the council and jamie oliver foundation just to add to that um on our what's happening section of sugar smart uh there's a story on the launch of the bristol campaign so if you guys want to learn a bit more do check it out. Okay, the next um, question is about uh, what other age groups um, were reached through the Thirsty Eyes uh, video and campaign? And how do you feel about the results on Instagram? Also on Thirsty Eyes, did you go about um, a more in-depth uh, evaluation of impact? on young people? Um, sorry, can you say that beginning bit again? So there's um, two questions about the Thirsty Eyes um, campaign. Yeah. So first of all, what were the other age groups of the other viewers? So you mentioned the young people. And how do you feel about the Instagram results? The age groups were difficult because um, some of the analytics don't show up for younger age groups, especially if you have to sign up um, as an 18 year old. So actually understanding how many of the younger people were reaching the video was was quite difficult. We did have some figures that I um, shared on the slides. Um, which showed that, I mean, as most of them were over 18, so 35% of our viewers were over 18. I think 11% were 
um, between 13 and 20. Uh, so a 13 to 17 year age group. Uh, it was Jessica Milton who, um, who, who made this question. So if it's not yet clear, Jessica, do keep using the attendee chat um, uh, to, to ask further questions. The other one was about um, how you measured, evaluated the impact of the video on changing young people's behavior. I think it's been very difficult to evaluate um, fully because we don't really have a benchmark for how well social media actually reaches target groups and what the outcome of that reach is. Looking at our um, population in Bristol, we have about 70,700 um, young people between the ages of 16 and 24. And if you look at the figures that we've got here through our reach through YouTube and Facebook and Instagram, by my estimate, which may be a little bit out, um, I think we've reached probably about a third of that age group between 16 to 24 years. So that's not a bad reach, but it's um, following on from that as to whether they've made any change in their behaviour is actually quite difficult to identify. And um, just to say that in terms of evaluating our whole um, communications and marketing programme, we're using the Public Health England um, evaluation framework. Um, so we're looking at um, raising the um, awareness of the issue, raising awareness of the brand, uh, make sure, making sure that our uh, messages are engaging to the range of audiences that we want to target. So they are communications and marketing type um, targets, but with the view then that a number of activities and um, things will go on across the city, including the food offer, that will be the thing that change the behaviour. So really our communications and marketing is about um, raising the issue um, to create that kind of base for then behaviour change to be able to happen. Okay, in the interest of keeping in, in time for our next presenter, um, my suggestion is that um, we provide the answers to these questions uh, in written uh, at the end of the webinar. Um, and without further ado, um, we are going to hear from Rachel Hunt from Healthy Norwich about working with uh, their local water company, Hanglian Water, and also some of the excellent work they've been piloting with secondary schools. Rachel, the mic is yours. Super, thank you very much and hello everybody. Um, I will try and be efficient and keep to time and answer any questions at the end because I know we've got about 15-20 sort of minutes. Um, but yes, my name is Rachel Hunt and I lead a project called Healthy Norwich, which is um, really the Norwich CCG working in partnership with um, its local city councils, district council and within the public health team and it's aimed at preventing poor health outcomes for residents of our city but very much embedded within, um, within the CCG so public health ambition embedded operationally on the ground um, so it's it's a fairly unique approach to how prevention is going to be sort of considered for our future development for delivering health care um, and I probably should say at the very beginning um, that what's been happening in Norwich is a, a really a scaled down version as to what you've already heard um, I am part-time myself and Healthy Norwich is really just me so um, I deliver a number of different activities and, and projects with the support of all the partners I just mentioned um, and the three focus areas of activity um, include healthy weight and lifestyle and, and the rest of the activities I'm focused on are, are listed in the current slide and I've just included a few um, logos to show the sort of work that I'm involved in but there's more information about Healthy Norwich on the Norwich CCG website if you'd like to know more about the broader activity I'm doing. Um, but just to skip on with the presentation so I can spend as much time talking to everybody um, about um, Sugar Smart. And so this, this slide really is just identifying why we've decided to, to really have an effective um, 
uh, attempt at tackling uh, health related problems um, for teenagers um, and really our picture in Norwich is very similar to all other cities and places across the UK where you know weight is a significant issue especially for our young children where weight is increasing quite alarmingly between reception and um, year six where children are being measured in school. So um, I, I suppose I've very briefly and, and very quickly skipped over the, the initial information, but trying to say that we really wanted to be focusing on prevention as the, as the partners came together and have a desire to try to work with children and young people. Um, we have a range of commission services, which most other cities or, or locations will also be having, but this is really trying to take um, a preventative step as to what we can be doing before those commission services are needed. Um, on a local level, we are working very closely with primary schools to try to support the rollout of the Daily Mile, which hopefully lots of you have already heard about. Um, and mentioned by um, Wendy and Claire in the previous presentation, primary schools seem to be quite on board with Sugar Smart, who is a change for life promotion. Um, lots has been handed out in schools as assemblies and presentations on sugar content, whereas trying to support and engage communication with secondary schools has been more of a challenge. And we particularly wanted to make sure that any project that we worked on um, really addressed one of the underlying issues um, of tackling health inequality. Um, and really the promotion of water was seen very much as a, a social equaliser that everybody has access to, to, to tap water. Um, and so that was really quite important. Um, Healthy Norwich also has a fairly small budget. And for this project, we really needed to um, identify a key partner, which was going to be vital to move it forward, um, but equally needed to make sure we had very clear expectations being set about capturing impact evidence. So those are the two sort of initial challenges we had. First of all, we all know that proving prevention is working is quite a, a tall order and a challenge to, to capture data, but also trying to find an organisation to, to work with and maybe provide us with some funding. So that led um, us to um, really go and knock on the door angling water and ask if they would like to be a partner um, in developing a, a project they um, first of all were a little bit reticent so if anybody wants to follow suit don't be put off by the initial um, maybe sort of queries by your local water authority because water authorities have a responsibility to educate the local population about water cleanliness and how we keep water hygienic and safe and what we should be doing to protect our water system they don't have a responsibility to um, really ensure individuals are aware of the health benefits of water however um, you know following the conversation through there was very clearly a, a, a very strong case for arguing their sort of corporate social responsibility and it didn't take very long for them to to see the um real positive messages that they'd be receiving from the wider community if they're a partner in this. Um, so with the support of Angling Water, who gave us £3,000, we um, developed a short animation. From our evidence of um, need, we understood that teenage boys were a particular audience that we were keen to try to, to engage with. Um, and working with our local youth advisory board, and college students, we um, developed a concept for a, an animation um, and really worked, worked, I suppose, th through their support to understand what the key messages would be. So even though we wanted to focus on trying to engage teenage boys, we'd also needed a quite a universal film that, that wasn't necessarily gender specific. So there's the odd um, reference to football and more boyish activities, if you wanted to Want, of a, want a better word but actually what we wanted was a, a really positive message and a positive film and we were quite lucky that we had a local celebrity who was happy to come be our um, voice for this animation and I think um, Sophia is now going to play the animation for us. The first has kicked in, what do you grab to drink? You know being thirsty is a warning your body's lacking water 
So water's the obvious choice, right? But choose a fizzy drink, and boom, liquid sugar. 100% of your recommended daily limit straight to your bloodstream. The sugar attacks your teeth, causing decay and discoloration with a strength similar to battery acid. 20 minutes in and your blood sugar level spikes. Your liver gets in on the act, it turns the sugar into fat. FYI, water has zero calories. It helps you lose weight and keeps you trim. Water is best for thinkers and players. All the cool people drink it. Movie stars, footballers, scientists, rock stars and gamers. But not this guy. He doesn't drink water. If you choose a can, you probably need to pee about now. Unfortunately, you're peeing out all the good nutrients and any water that was in the drink. Hardly refreshing, right? Finally, you're tired, you're irritable and with a reduced capacity to learn. Welcome to your sugar crash. Water has none of that, my friend. Oh no. Your brain performs better, your mood improves and, well, you're just a much healthier person. Plus, it's free. Just turn on the tap. Now I call that a win. Winners drink water. Hi, I had quite a lot of crackles over my um, copy of the animation, so apologies anybody else who didn't have a very good sound quality. It might have been um, me loading up for um, this presentation, but I do have a, a YouTube link I can share, and there's also one at the end of the presentation. Um, so, so yeah, that's the animation which we wanted to make sort of quite catchy and fun and um, it, unknown probably to other people that lots of references to um, yellow and green are because that's the Norwich City football colours. Um, so really with with the support of the young people who um, were were able to sort of co-produce that with us we developed um, developed a film which we first of all used as to support a Facebook campaign so with a small budget of 500 pounds we had a month's um, campaign which um, using the um, the ability to target we um, focused it very much on the geographical area of Norfolk but also tried to pick up um, people within secondary schools in Norfolk and also where they had sort of ex expressed a, a certain sort of sporting preference um, because of the connection with football so really trying to reach um, the, the right number of people um, so in terms of the data I've got our impressions data was, um, I think, about 50,000, but the, the information that I'd received about actual sort of number of people actually viewing and, and watching the film was that we only had 2,000 people watch the whole film. So the impressions from Facebook is actually where a film appears in the Facebook feed. So when you're scrolling through and looking at your photographs, when something is, is there, that's counted as an impression. So really, we wanted to make sure that we understood the impact. Um, one of the learnings we had from uh, the number of people who watched the film is that films need subtitles. So the version that you've just watched had subtitles on. The one that we used for the Facebook campaign didn't. So um, just for, for everybody's information. Um, and also that you need a film that's shorter than um, a minute for some um, social media platforms. So at this stage, we've only used Facebook, um, but we are looking at how we can utilize some of the content to share via Instagram and having a, another campaign later in the year. So Anglian Water have also been using the film um, quite a lot, which has been um, really good because they have a huge reach across the east of England. Um, they were a sort of a, a corporate sponsor for a cycling event across the UK and the animation appeared um, on, on some of their tour buses that were going around supporting the tour of Britain. They um, have an education offer going into schools and they've included the, the film as part of that. And um, there's also um, mentioned by Bristol, the refill project, Angling Water are now going to be um, developing a, a refill um, within with a, a refill project, I say, within this area. And it might be something that some of some people's um, water authorities are getting involved in. So I think it's not necessarily common across the UK. So it's a good a good time maybe to get, get involved in um, 
water authorities who may well be looking to partner with um, unique individuals and sort of partnerships that they haven't had before and we can all be capitalizing on on that opportunity so just to, um just to move through um, as quick as i can we then utilize the opportunity to work with secondary schools so really the development of the resources was the, the initial phase and this working with secondary school is really the, the main aim of what we're trying to do um, so really this was an opportunity to start a conversation and we are then very much focused on the role of sort of peer-to-peer -peer, um, um, engagement and support as students communicating between each other as the best way um, as the best way to really embed and, and, and really try to ensure a cultural change. So the photograph you've got here is two of the dietitians actually from our local acute hospital who um, were very keen to get him get him involved and, and on board who um, helped deliver a sugar smart assembly. Um, so this was in a, a fairly large secondary school in Norwich and 300 year eight students were the initial target audience for our first assembly. Following on from that, um, they, um, the school looked at the role of sugar champions where they managed to identify volunteers within um, the school pupils who were keen to support the idea of peer-to-peer -peer working. Um, and so they were, they've been involved in delivering similar assemblies to their own um, year groups because we just focused on the year eight students. Um, they've been sharing the animation between them. Um, but importantly, they've been trying to work out, you know, how a cultural change can be brought about within the school. Um, one of the key things they've been doing um, most recently is working quite closely with their school caterer because they'd worked out uh, from from the students' perspective that the what was on offer um, in the school wasn't really what they were happy with, especially in terms of the drinks that were being made available. Um, so that's that's been really beneficial. I did have a really short clip of the um, assembly, but looking at the time, I'm really happy that I can share that later on. Really, it's just showing that we we sort of utilise the opportunity with a, a comedy stooge. One of my colleagues um, was there um, and it really was a very, very funny um, assembly and really did engage students. And we had um, a boy up on stage as we were making our own Coca-Cola. Um, and I think this probably from my point of view is the most important bit because um, I um I am conscious that we're, you know, quite a small scale offer, um, but actually this is really achievable for any um, any authority and, and organisation who is keen to develop sugar smart activity with a very small budget and really very small time and resources. So our next steps, um, we've recognised that to continue working within the secondary school, we are going to be commissioning a local youth advisory service who are already working within schools to develop um, support for better outcomes for young people and thankfully the sugar smart offer fits very well with what they're doing and they're going to be um, continuing to work with our dietitians so their offer is going to include things like drop-in sessions which they already do for um, other topics like exam stress and um, bullying and um, body image and confidence so they're now going to be including sugar smart in that um, so it's an effective um, offer already. They're going to be running focus groups for us to really to try to work out how young people can really be the driving force behind um, the behaviour change. They're planning a full what they've called a drop down day um, where they take all the students off um, curriculum for a day and have, that's going to be totally focused on um, health and sugar. And finally they're going to be running um, more assemblies with the support of the students. Um, What's most important from our point of view is then by actually having um, the, the organisation called MAP, who um, are the youth advisory um, organisation on board, is they're going to be able to support us with having the evidence to show what works and how attitudes and behaviour does change. And from that, we hope to be able to have developed a single offer for all secondary schools um, in Norwich to be able to engage with a Sugar Smart programme. And that finally is going to contribute some of the wider activity we're doing to address um, obesity, um, taking a whole systems approach, really recognising that, you know, really just sort of looking at Sugar Smart on its own needs to be 
sort of considered as a, a wider network so that we can really make the wide impact that we, we need to do. Um, and importantly, our whole system approach is very much co-produced. So that's where we're hoping local communities and local neighbourhoods are going to be able to get involved and drive activity forward. So that was a bit of a whistle stop tour. I'm sorry for rushing everybody. Um, please feel free to email me directly. Equally, please feel free to use um, our Sugar Smart film. Um, it doesn't have much reference to Norwich, apart from obviously the Norwich City Football Colours. But if it's something that would help with your, um, your campaigns, it's a resource that's created um, and please do use it. Um, and thank you very much. I'll happily answer any questions. Hi there. Thank you so much, Rachel. And thank you, Wendy and Claire as well for your presentations. Um, we are happy to stick around past three. So three isn't a, a hard cutoff. So if you have any questions for um, either of the presenters, please do use the attendee chat. Um, but just to again to mention, we will be sharing all the Q&As uh, in writing after the webinar as well. So, uh, Sophia, did we have uh, any other questions that didn't get covered earlier? Oh, we have a few more coming in. Um, so, uh, Debbie asks, um, she was wondering how much uh, the public health contributed financially to have the clinical commissioning group lead on this program in Norwich. So, this question is for Rachel. So, um, so Norwich is quite unique. Um, my post is part-time. I'm only... Um, 25 hours a week but I am funded three ways my um, post is funded by public health by the CCG and by the city council so the public health team didn't actually give us any funding for the sugar smart activity but I suppose in effect they are supporting the healthy Norwich program but as I mentioned healthy Norwich has a number of different work activities so this is you know a, a quite a small part of the bigger picture um, but it, I'm trying to demonstrate that really time and money don't need to preclude you from being able to deliver quite a successful program. Uh, and uh, th thank you so much Rachel. Um, so on the flip side of that <laughs> uh, Claire Davies asks um, uh, just a clarification did Bristol Water Fund uh, ten thousand pounds towards the campaign. So that's a question for Wendy. No, no, it didn't. I mean, that was just a sort of ballpark figure that sort of came up with everything that they talked about possibly doing right at the very beginning. But as I say, you know, each time we spoke with them, the list was getting smaller because I think everyone finds that they're really short of money, and it's about using existing resources as much as possible. Um, and developing on those. Um, so no, I mean, I wouldn't be able to put a figure on what they they did provide for us, but um, you know, a lot of their time and effort went into some of the work that we did with them. Great, thank you so much for that, Wendy. Uh, the next question is from uh, Gillian Pitt. Um, she asks, uh, do you have a healthy schools program operating in primary and secondary schools? Um, the new statement of intent for London Healthy Schools Bronze Award is to reduce the amount of sugar consumed throughout the school day. Uh, just wondering if this uh, was widespread through the country. So unfortunately in Norfolk, our healthy schools um, offer through the public health team was decommissioned about um, 18 months, two years ago. So in a way, um, this, this activity and the work we're doing is really, I suppose, plugging a bit of a gap. We do know uh, schools are aware of what healthy schools um, services were, but we're keen to continue that. So unfortunately, um, it's, a, it's a bit sad to say that we don't have a healthy schools offer in Norfolk. And in Bristol, we do. We actually retained our healthy schools team uh, when I know others around the country were disappearing. Uh, we have what we call the Mayor's Award for Healthy Schools um, and the system has really just changed. So what they do now is encourage schools to do badges and within the food and nutrition badge and the oral health badge, there are aspects of sugar smart work being done in both of those. Um, and then they build up their number of badges um, heading towards the Mayor's Award. Thank you so much. Uh, there was a question earlier um, about the uh, the Bristol Water Bar, um, I believe it was from Jess from uh, Bath and Northeast Somerset. Um, it's uh, wondering which company 
uh, put together the water bar. So which company you guys worked with in Bristol? Um, I'm afraid I'll have to get back to Jess on that one. I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I think it was a local company that um, did the design for it, I guess she means. So I will uh, find out and get back to her on that one. Well, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Um, I think we've covered everything that was um, that was brought up. Um, but otherwise, yeah, if you do have any questions after this webinar, please do email us and we can put you in touch with the presenters as well. So I think um, I think we can uh, safely wrap up here. Uh, just to remind you guys again, we will be sharing the presentations. Um, the oh, sorry, uh, an answer has just come from uh, Fee, uh, who worked on the uh, Sugar Smart Bristol campaign and all their wonderful work. Uh, she said it was an artist from um, the Upfest Festival that was employed by Bristol Water at their cost. Uh, thank you so much for that, Fee. Um, if you have any information about uh, perhaps who put together or built the display as well, if that was done through a third party, that'd be good to know because it was beautifully done as well, the physical display. Um, so just to say, we will be sharing the presentations, uh, the webinar link, uh, and the Q&As uh, after today's webinar. Again, if you have any questions, please do get in touch. Uh, also, uh, if you are interested in um, learning more about this work, we're always quite happy to uh, connect uh, different campaigns across the country to share more learning. Um, but also, uh, just to remind you guys, uh, if you're not running a Sugar Smart campaign locally, but would like to find out more information, we would absolutely love to hear from you. Um, so you'll have our contact details in the follow-up emails. Um, and uh, just to say, we will be running other Sugar Smart webinars. We think this is a really great thing and um, participants have been quite interested in this bit of um, the campaign. So if you have any ideas for other areas we should focus on in the future, so whether it's specific sectors or specific approaches or ways of working, we would absolutely love to hear from you. Um, and we could perhaps even uh, send some questions through in the emails so you can engage with us that way. Um, and so I just wanted to also say a massive thank you again to the speakers, to Claire, Wendy, and Rachel, and also a big, big thanks to Alize from uh, this SFC team who has uh, kindly pulled all this together and done all the wonderful background work. So thank you so much, Alize. And uh, thank you to all of you who participated and sent in questions and contributed to the discussion. Great, thanks. Thank you.